Welcome to the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit at Chip House. How's it going for yourself? Is it uh, a good time? or? Uh... Yeah, it's a great time. So first is in Prague, and this is my first time in Prague. What a wonderful city. It is. It's, it's a great place. Uh, it really is. Um, it's not just the beer, and a lot of other things to see, and the theatre and everything else. Yeah, it was beautiful to just get to walk around the, uh, the city centre. Um, that's, that's always great. And here at the conference, uh, it's just actually amazing how much diversity of uh, project and diversity of talk is, is going on here at the event. So yeah, it's, it's kind of endless. You, know, you can just walk upstairs or downstairs and kind of stay here forever. It's like something out of Star Trek in some ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the event has definitely taken over the entire Hilton. <laughs> yes, it's very good. Right, um, just to ask you some simple questions. Uh, can you tell us what you do as a Cloud Foundry Foundation CTO? Yeah, absolutely. So first, let's start with what the Cloud Foundry Foundation is. Um, we're the home of the uh, Cloud, Foundry Foundation, Cloud Foundry platform. Um, it's actually three different platforms. Um, we have one platform we call the Application Runtime, which is it allows you to create a platform as a service style experience. Think Heroku um, is really kind of what, what that was designed around. Um, that's what Cloud Foundry is predominantly known for. Uh, but sitting next to it, we, re we recently uh, spent a lot of time uh, sharing this, but um, we have a project that takes the Kubernetes platform, um, wraps it using our operational knowledge, um, and then exposes and integrates that with the application experience, and that's called a container runtime. So application runtime, container runtime. Underneath that, we have this project called Bosch. That is a distributed systems release engineering tool chain. It's a whole bunch of words. It basically means it abstracts cloud infrastructure, and it makes it easy to operate complex distributed systems. Um, so, so these are the, the, the three primary like large projects that we have. Uh, we have a lot of other little ones that are related to it. Um, we're we're an uh, independent association of um, over 70 members. More than 40% of them are actually end users, and typically they're customers of the vendors that are involved, which is pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's very, very infrequent that a customer of a vendor or a distribution gets involved in the upstream very heavily. Um, we've been blessed with, with quite a lot of that. Um, so my role as the, the CTO for the organization is to help support the uh, collaboration of the technology community, uh, number one. Uh, but also, of course, you know, to spend time making sure that we can explain what is the kind of the emergent trends that are coming out of our, our community. What are they building towards? It's a bit like um, giving a direction and educating kind of idea. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, the, the roadmap for our projects are determined based on those that are participating in the projects. So um, what, what I try to do is work closely with the project leads to help them see opportunities for collaboration. Um, I work closely with the, you know, the different vendors that compete in the market to make sure they see their opportunities for collaboration when they're not obvious. Um, and also to help, help them hear from the end users. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, how did the Cloud Foundry or Cloud Foundation? Um, the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Foundry, <laughs> yes. Uh, form or come about? Uh, was it uh, an accident or was it one of those beery nights in a pub? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly hope it wasn't that. Um, no. Yeah. So, so the, the history of the Cloud Foundry software um, is actually important to understand. It, it starts back in 2011. Uh, VMware, uh, specifically Paul Moritz, was leading VMware. He hired uh, some folks out of Google um, and, and then pulled together a team inside of, uh, of VMware and said, I want an open source platform as a service project, right? Because they, they believed this was I going to be really I didn't realize it was VMware. Right. It was originally VMware. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of years later, uh, EMC specifically decided to create Pivotal software. And what they did when they created Pivotal was they took a number of uh, technology assets as well as people um, and out of both EMC and out of VMware and they formed this new startup called Pivotal. Um, they got some uh, uh, additional investment from General Electric, you know, big company, uh, industrial company, um, and that was where Pivotal Software came to be. Pivotal then proceeded with the development of Cloud Foundry. It was one of the, the assets that they, um, that they were given when they were started. And they, they proceeded to develop Cloud Foundry and try to find you know, the right product market fit for it. As they were doing that with this open source code, um, they, they started collaborating with IBM. Uh, they started collaborating with, with SAP. Um, they started to just basically see a lot more industry interest in making it a shared project. Mm -hmm. 
So in January of 2015, although it had been announced back in, you know, earlier in uh, uh, the 2014 uh, timeframe, um, in January of 2015, the Cloud Foundry Foundation was created um, with uh, an initial group of member companies who took ownership over, over the project. Um, the code at that point was donated by Pivotal to this independent association. Um, I mean, this, in, in the United States, there's this concept of uh, what are called 501c yeah. organizations, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons why they're so important, Linux Foundation, um, you know, Apache Software Foundation, <laughs> They all have like slightly different takes on collaboration, but a really key thing that's important here is that they're they're neutral, and they also have the benefit that once you put intellectual property into them, they can't be acquired by a for-profit company. And so when you're dealing with let's say IBM and Pivotal, and IBM is launching the Bluemix service, and Pivotal is trying to launch their Pivotal Cloud Foundry product, they're going to go compete in the market. Mm. Pivotal wants IBM's help. Yeah. IBM wants to see the code move to a place that's neutral. I helped uh, Jim Chigelski out at the time when the Apache Foundation yeah. was being formed, and I think that became a kind of a, a business model of some sort. And, and the, the Apache license is, is kind of used in a lot of places, so maybe it's had some influence. Well, the Apache software license is, is um, well, first, we use it. Um, it's also increasingly being used by, um, by lots, of, lots of projects, in particular when there's commercialization happening. Um, I, I'm a member of the ASF as well, and it's, it's you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a variety of philosophies around how to run these these organizations, um, and I think that's good because it lets code go to a place that's the best fit for it. Sometimes it needs more commercial support. Other times it's just needs good development by yeah. developers. It's not always uh, if you talk to the legal people, they always tell you it's the legal thing, uh, but it's not always just legal. There's considerations like actual running a technical project uh, and, yeah. and getting groups yeah. of people to do something. So it's not just filling in pieces of paper. You have to right. think and, and try to be um, creative. Uh, How your community is shaped, what are the drivers of that community, um, that's probably the most important thing for someone working in open source to understand. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the other problems. When we started on uh, Free Software Foundation and open source, nobody quite knew where we were going to. And there was a long argument. But I think we've reached the other end of it now. Um, um, what kind of operating system do Cloud Foundry systems run on? Is that the right question to ask? Well, you know, funny enough, um, we, I can't answer it, but I would say it's kind of the wrong question. Yeah. The, the reason why I say it's the wrong question is that part of the value of the, the Cloud Foundry technologies are that they actually eliminate conversations about the operating system. Mm. So first, these are, these are distributed systems. So it's, yeah. it's very rarely um, running on just a single machine. Yeah. And we have kind of an emulator that lets you do it on your laptop. Yeah. Um, but th th this is a platform which is made up of lots of virtual machines or bare metal systems that are supporting it. Um, now, operating systems have to be running in those VMs. Um, and so we, we do use uh, the Linux operating system as the base OS. We do also have support for uh, Windows-based operating systems. And that really, the reason for having two different OSs is entirely tied to the software that a developer wants to push into the Cloud Foundry platforms may actually rely on the OS to some extent. Um, the overwhelming majority are going to land on Linux because these are, these are just platform neutral languages like Python yeah. Node, yeah. etc. Well, in the early days, back in the 90s, we had problems with uh, Windows servers. They were a problem. And uh, we, we, Linux came along. And it kind of, or GNU Linux, as some people call it, came along and it suddenly, we suddenly found that we could build something called the internet. Yeah. Because the cost of each installation was either zero or very little compared with the uh, Windows offering or Microsoft offering. Um, so it, 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 we live in a different world now. The whole thing is completely different from the way it was. Um, and so uh, probably the younger people wouldn't quite understand it. Those of us like myself and yourself who've lived through it. We've seen, it, seen all of this, and it was kind of um, a bit of a long drag, but we got there in the end. Um, um, where do you think we were going to? Um, oh, here we go. Um, this is the one I should ask you. Do you think the world of open source software has changed in recent, changed in recent years? Well, I just said something myself. But if you want to add your own, your own 10 cents worth or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, my five cents. I don't think it's well, worth the whole 10. Well, um, <laughs> my, my, my five cents here is that 
open, open source software is, um, it really started with the kind of the core notion that a developer can, quote, scratch their own itch. Mm. I mean, it, it, it truly did, right? It was an early sharing. It was, it was really an intellectual pursuit. Um, and, and that's still true today for a lot of individuals and for the, actually the overwhelming majority of projects, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's, I mean, there's a minor shift. If you just look at just GitHub-based hosted projects, um, to some extent you could argue that some developers aren't just scratching their itch, but they're actually putting code out there because it's part of a resume building process for them. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's definitely material. Um, but the, as you, as you kind of look at the scale of projects and you get to a certain scale, um, there, there's an inflection point. I don't know exactly what that inflection point is, but there's a point where you start looking at projects that are, it, this is enterprise software. You know, it is open source. And you, you start to flip from the individual developer kind of driving based on their interest to um, this is about commercialization or this is about enterprise use and largely you're going to have developers that are working on behalf of the vendor communities, which are paying them to work on the project for the purpose of them offering product, and users are going to participate. But, but it's shifted to kind of a shared R&D model at, at that end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what's happened in the last several years is that, is that that acceptance that we have this spectrum of styles or needs that are being serviced through just open source software itself, um, that, that seems to be, it seems every people are getting more comfortable with it, mm. right? The reality that not everything is individual developers scratching their own itch, and we have to figure out how to make it work successfully yeah. across all the potential motivators. Mm. Yes, well at least, uh, at least teams can work together with that kind of thing. Uh, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you're asking this question, this is a, probably a final question, but I'll ask you anyway, and you, you can see Tell me what you think. Um, uh, what do you think we're going to with containers and Kubernetes and similar cloud software? Or, yeah. or do you want to answer that one? Or, or? Sure, sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to. So, so I think that what's interesting right now is, um, is two things. So first, there's a trend of software development um, where we're, we're shifting some of the architectural design principles that we used for business software, or websites, or or whatever type of internal application that you're building. Um, and enterprises are trying to learn from the, the web scale organizations that are out there. Um, I'm sure there's a joke uh, about web scale somewhere in here that we could apply, but, uh, uh, but, there, but there are a lot of practices that, um, that, that they, they pioneered, they developed, and they learned. And, the outcome of those practices is uh, more resilient software and more uh, rapid iteration and shorter you know, time to, to market to, to release the capability. Um, so that's the macro trend and there's different architectural ways to get there. Um, what we've also found is that the, the Docker um, did an amazing job of improving the user experience of the Linux kernel features that we kind of collectively call containers, right? So C groups, namespacing, um, use of particular file systems. It, they improve the, the experience of using those features. And that was incredibly important because otherwise those features were really just hidden inside platforms like Cloud Foundry, which predated Docker. Um, now as a developer, I can start to think in terms of these isolated processes. Um, I have container image formats and a bunch of tools that make it really easy to work with this. Um, I think we're going to see a change in the software supply chain. And it's already started to happen, right? A lot of uh, independent software vendors are distributing their code as, uh, as Linux image format um, uh, files. But it, that, that shift in the software supply chain actually needs to continue to accelerate because once you start merging the notion of immutable containers, right, which is the web scale company approach, yeah. Yeah. with now software distribution, my question to you is, is your software supply chain fast enough to constantly deploy new versions of your code, yeah. especially if you've got potential vulnerabilities in there, just as an example? Yeah, that's one of the things everyone worries about, uh, even, yeah. even in the Debian project or sure. any, any open source project. Um, have you got enough 
people in the army have developed this to keep the supply chain going. Um, we seem to be okay at the moment, well, in theory. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I mean, I think open source software generally. Um, I mean, some projects, they, they go, they wane. Uh, if, if they've been set up effectively to have enough end user support, they're going to be sustained as long as they're valuable to the users, and that's super helpful, um, even if vendors kind of pull away from them. Um, so, so that's always a risk. I, I, think that the, I think the main thing, though, is for proprietary software that's being, that's being shipped. Yeah. If the if the container is going to be the unit of that you're shipping, you better get really good at producing and publicizing and pushing those those changes mm -hmm. out to your, your ecosystem. Yeah. The reason why I say that is that you know you asked a question about operating systems. You think about a normal IT organization; they've got a bunch of OSs they're managing. Mm -hmm. They probably have a patch management solution. Yeah. The scope of what the ISV is responsible for is just their custom code, just their proprietary code that sits gets installed into an operating system. When we package these things into a Linux container image and, and we ship a you know, root file system along with my, my own code, I'm actually dragging along with it a whole bunch of code that I'm not, I don't own. Yeah. And there's it's increased risk. So what I want to see in the industry right now is, is for the ISV industry specifically, if they're not going to the as a service model, they're going to continue to ship code, they need to figure out how to not just deliver new images quickly, <laughs> but also how do they get those images out into their user base as fast as possible to just really, as a user, I would demand that because mm -hmm. I want to be protected. Yeah, that's true enough. Uh, you don't want any problems or anything. It's uh, in a fast moving world. Uh, okay, well, I think that's it. So, um, Chip Childers, thank you very much. That's very kind of you.